you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney prior to or during any question. If you can't afford one, the court will appoint one for you. Do you understand your rights? This episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast may contain descriptions of acts of violence or that of a sexual nature and should be for people that are 18 years or older. Heed my warning, people. I do not get the facts of these cases off of the internet or for some television show. The facts I'm retelling you were presented to me by the victims of the crimes or the perpetrators who committed the crimes against the victims. My descriptions of the crime scenes, what I saw with my own two eyes. If you're going to get offended, please turn this podcast off now. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. And as always, I'm your host, Woody Overton. And again, before I get started, Shout out to my Patreon and Convict members who subscribe. I hope you're enjoying all the extra bonus material and episodes. Thank you so much. You make the show run. Okay, y'all, today um, it's got to be one of the longest series I've ever done, but Mo continues, and this is where it really gets sweet. And you talk about good police work, right? The the From the beginning, From the crime scene being processed to developing the suspects to um, the streets talking and getting people to come forward and disproving what Jarrell Marshall had said, um, getting warrants like almost immediately, uh, and then him turning himself in and denying everything. But then what do you do? You build the case around it. You everybody he mentioned, you go check their oil, right, and see if he was telling the truth. Well, guess what? Jarrell thought all those homies were going to take care of him, right, the ones he had made the admissions to about the murder. And them dudes were like, fuck that. And when it came down to the nut-cutting time, you know, it is what it is. They told the truth. So as detectives, we had to get – it just went from one to the next to the next to the next. And we developed – the probable cause, um, I would tell you it's way beyond a reasonable doubt. We could have gone on trial right away with this and, and won. You know, we worked it, and we did what we did. We worked it all the way up until the point. Uh, and when we had warrants for Mo, Jarrell's locked up. We've interviewed everybody that there is to interview. And so what are we doing now? We are waiting on Mo. Okay, uh, um, to get arrested in your ones, and it happened. All right, Brian and I get a phone call. It wasn't long, y'all. When once we turned to one, the, the New Orleans Police Department, they damn well knew who who Mo was. But George Hefney was. I mean, he's like a banger, right? I mean, been shot numerous times and shot, but suspected of multiple murders and stuff like that. So they got him. And we get the call. Brian called me and said, hey, man, they got him. He's in Orleans Parish Prison, otherwise known as OPP. Now, let me tell you all about OPP. OPP, or Orleans Parish Prison, was consistently rated as the worst central lockup in the United States of America and had been for like 20 or 30 years, kind of like bloody Angola, Louisiana state penitentiary was rated the worst prison in the United States. 
Orleans Parish Prison. Holy shit. This place was a shit hole. All right. And if you go into New Orleans on Interstate 10 and you hang a right like you're going towards the Superdome, and you can go down and it would be this big, tall, like fucking huge building. And, 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 um, I don't know how many floors it was, probably 20, 20 plus floors. And it was all prisoners. Uh, but it's run by the Orleans Parish Sheriff's Office. Now, Orleans Parish Sheriff's Office did not have a criminal division. All they did was take care of prisoners and do courtroom stuff, which is different. Most sheriff's offices have, uh, all my, I mean, they have the the enforcement cap- capabilities, et cetera. But for whatever reason, in Orleans Parish, New Orleans Police Department handled all the criminal enforcement. The Orleans Sheriff's deputies were prison guards or courtroom guards or whatever, right? So, but this this building, I mean, so Brian, Brian and I load up. We go down there, and we're not expecting to get anything out of this cat. I mean, his his uh, his fucking criminal history was long and impressive, right? And the I think he's a hardened criminal. He's not going to say shit. He knows he's up for the death penalty, and we, it takes us an hour, hour and a half to get there. And Brian had never been to OPP before. I had uh, numerous times, and this was right before keep. Keep in mind, this is right before Hurricane Katrina uh, and and Rita, right? When Katrina came, it fucked OPP. It's done with. It's just, it totally closed it, fucked it, um, and it would never be the same. So this is like really May, June, July, August. It's like three months before this place was totally destroyed. So Brian and I pull up to it. And look, it takes city blocks Right, that's how big it is. City blocks, and you got to find a place to park. Uh, it was nighttime when we got there. I remember that, and we buzz our way in. Uh, um, and look, they NOPD. We jokingly re- say that NOPD stands for No Other Police Departments because they don't give a fuck if you're a cop from somewhere else. And it's kind of the same way about Orleans Parish Prison. I mean. I really give a fuck. In most places, if you go to the parish prison or to the prison or the jail and you you, uh, you show them a badge, fuck, you get the red carpet treatment, right? They roll out and they handle business for you, whatever you need to do. And professionalism, not Orleans Parish. <laughs> we get there and you're standing outside uh, trying to get buzzed in through a sally port, this monster building, you look up, it just absolutely blacks out the sky, and it goes for, like, several city blocks and smells, people. Before you even hit the fucking building, the smell of the body stench and the odor just hits you. And I'm like, oh, my God. I mean, you know, New Orleans stinks, right? Uh, everybody knows that. Like, you're walking down bourbon, you, you know, it has that certain smell. This is way, way fucking worse than that, all right? And so they bust us into the interior, and whatever office was at the desk or the deputy was at the desk. We told him we were there for Majority Chefney, and he was locked up on our warrants, and um, we wanted to interview him and then transport him back. And, fuck, it took fucking ever. And, the, the like, after 30, 40 minutes, I went back up to the window and asked the deputy, and they were like, uh, let me check again. And then it came back and said, but we can't find him. Like, what you mean you can't find him? She said, I, you said his name is Major Chef. And I said, ma'am, here are the warrants. You have them in your computer. She said, well, we can't find him. And I'm like, did you lose him? I mean, is, he's down for a death penalty charge. I mean, what the fuck you mean you can't find him? Now, y'all, that I think part of this was I really don't give a fuck attitude. I'm drawing my paycheck, and and they don't care what police department come in or whatever. I mean, but how in the fuck do you lose somebody? Well, that was OPP, all right? When they said it's the worst central lockup, I've heard stories of people getting lost for, like, weeks. And, and you know, the guards, uh, the inmates trying to get the guards to tell, you know, get some help or whatever, and the guards, like, fucking ignoring them. And this place is so 
massive. You could see that, it, you know, the guards walking down the, the tiers might be like, well, fuck it. I don't, I don't got to worry about them. Let the next shift worry about them. And they, people literally get lost for, for weeks at a time. And it, I mean, like this, they lost our guy and shit. He hadn't been locked up for five or six hours and was in, in for first degree murder. But long story short, I asked to speak to a supervisor and I got, and, you know, that I said, look, man, I said, I'm not here to fuck with you. Uh, I'm not here to fucking pull your chain or whatever. I said, but this is fucking serious. This is a death penalty case. And I want to talk to you, supervisor. Remember y'all, everybody answers to somebody. And supervisor came up and I was like, look, she's saying that they can't find this guy. He's in for first degree murder warrants um, that we have on him. I said, do I need to call the sheriff and, and, get some help here. I mean, uh, is it an escape? And he's like, no, 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 man. We're going to take care of it. And he gets on his radio, calls, whatever. He said, I'll be back in about five minutes. And he came back. Um, of course, we had secured our weapons in the car outside. And the he buzzes through. He said, you want to interview him first? I said, yes, we do. So he buzzes through into an interview room. And we sit down by this little metal table like and this is actually like you see on TV, and they bring Mo in the door. Now let me describe him for you. In Patreon and Convicts, you'll have the pictures put up. The Mo comes in, and he's in his OPP orange jumpsuit. He's handcuffed at the waist and he's shackled at the feet. Uh, uh, the the I say handcuffs at the waist. They they have the cuffs and they have a black box and they have a chain belt around their middle. And that black box is chained with the key facing towards your stomach. So you can't manipulate the keyhole uh, from the outside. So they bring him in like that. And he's a little bitty thing, y'all. He was short and like black, black. Like, I don't know how you describe that. I don't know. but Not midnight black, but something close to that. And he had this short... um, Frizzy hair, not an afro or anything like that. I mean, probably had it cut in the last couple of weeks. And he had that very distinct scarring underneath his eye. And it looked, it really did look like a teardrop. Um, and so they bring him in and sit him down. And we talk to him for a bit. And I'll, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and read you the transcripts. And of course, naturally remember on these transcripts that we talk to these people generally for a little while so we can get the story straight before we start recording because we had those little fucking uh, mini cassette tape things that were like 30 minutes on each side and you would have to stop and swap it and it's just a pain in the ass. So let me read it to you. I think you're going to find this interesting. Now, you got to remember, Mo comes in, he's got a bit of attitude right off the bat. He's he's straight up fucking gangster. Don't give a fuck. And at some point when we talked to him, he'd like... Uh, lifted up part of his shirt and was showing the different gun wounds, gunshot wounds he's had and shit like that. I mean, he was a fucking banger for life, right? So we're going to start with, yeah, I'm only going to read one more transcript after this, but it's very important. But this one is really important. And then we're going to do the trial, and I'm going to tell you exactly what happened to him, and, and I think you'll be shocked. Mm, I love that sound. That sound just makes me smile. It's the sound of another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business, so upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online, and in-person sales and effortlessly stay informed. Scaling your business is a journey of endless possibility. Believe me, Real Life Real Crime started out selling t-shirts and stickers, and today they're selling everything from Real Life Real Crime hoodies to backpacks. And we're not stopping there because success is a million milestones on a forever evolving path. I love how Shopify has the tools and resources to make it easy for 
any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. Like mine, Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale. Reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Synchronize your online and in-person sales. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash R-L-R-C, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash R-L-R-C right now. Shopify.com slash R-L-R-C. All right, so here we go. It says, remember y'all, um, I'm going to say Brian and, and what Brian said and majority and then what he said and me and what I said. All right. So it's state versus majority Cheffany and Jarrell Marshall statement taken from majority Cheffany, Detective Brian Smith and Detective Woody Overton. Brian. All right, I'm Detective Brian Smith with Detective Woody Overton. We're at the Orleans Parish Prison. The date is 514 of 05. The time is 2248 hours. We were speaking with Majora Chefney, right? Majora, right? And y'all, that's the other thing. Mo had this little deep froggy voice, froggy voice, like deeper than mine. Uh, um, he said, right? And uh, Brian, what's your date of birth? Majora, inaudible. Brian, okay, we advise you your rights. You understood your rights? Majora. Yes, sir. Brian. Okay, basically, we want to talk to you about is you're, you're aware of the homicide that took place on Ed Brown Road, right? Majority. Yes, sir. Brian. All right, with one, Sean Alberts is the one that got killed. He's the deceased. Can you tell me what you know about that? Majority. Well, uh, I know... The red guy, which is inaudible, Christopher, yeah. Uh, back in April, Christopher broke into somebody's house, and they were supposed to be one Jarrell, Jarrell, one Daryl Cordell, one of those people. Brian, you talking about Jarrell Marshall? Majority, yeah, yes, sir. Brian, from Albany? Majority, Albany. And uh, so that's all approach the guy and ask him, Get get stuff from him. And that's when he he drawled down, and the dude Chris pulled out a gun. So when after they left, Drell and them doing like mm, they gonna get them, and audible they gonna get them. Woody, uh, hold hold on one second. Earlier when we talked before, started making this interview, you said. They're carrying stuff, and y'all got out on them, and you said he pulled a gun. Did he fire the gun, Major? Yeah, he shot two times, two shots. Woody, Chris did? Major, Chris, yeah, the red one. Woody, that's Chris Belazar? Major, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know his real name. Woody, if we showed you a picture of him, you'd be able to identify him, correct? Majori, yeah. Woody, okay. Majori, so lead up like a month done pass that when they say they come to the house, they was in a car. It was Jarrell, Travis, and Cordell, and Josh. They came and come and get some black and some black shirts and some black pants, and they say, they were going, they saw Chris, and they were going, they say they were going to see what he got. So Jarrell wound up leaving his phone at the house on the charge. That's how I got his phone. And the next morning, I went to the store and riding his truck, and on my way coming back up Old Baton Rouge Highway, 
I turned on Dylan Lane. I can't, I couldn't get through, so I called Rodney's phone, asked him why all the police was out there. So he said he going to walk down there to call him right back. So when he walked down by the time he got down there, I called him back. He was like, the police looking for me for a shooting. So then I told him, I ain't shot nobody. Brian, let's go back. Let's go, let's go back to Thursday night real quick, okay? Thursday night, when they came over to your house, to Rodney's house on Dillon Lane, you said Jarrell came over there? Majority. Yeah. Brian, and he brought it to you? Majority. Cordell. Brian, yeah. Cordell. Majority, yeah. Brian, and Josh? Majority. Josh and Travis. Brian and Travis, all right, and what'd they ask you for? Woody. Oh, was Josh and Travis related? Do you know that? Majority. I think, yeah. He said, brothers. Brian, all right, go ahead. What'd they ask you for? Majority. Black shirt, shirt, some black clothes and shoes. Brian, all right, who actually put that on? Did you see them change into it? Majority, no, they ain't changed it to right there and then and there. Brian, what uh, what what was what was Jarrell wearing? Majority, Jarrell had on blue jersey, some black dickies, and some white shoes. Cordell had on a black, a black, an audible shirt with some black dickies with some black shorts. And Travis, all of them had on all black, but one of them. Woody, which one was that? Do you remember? Majora, I, I think was Josh. He didn't have on no all black. Woody, Josh Dantzler, Majora, no uh, Travis brother Josh. Woody, okay. Do what? He that you know what kind of uh, what clothes did you give him? Majora, black black shirt. Black pants and black shoes. Brian, you had said earlier that they they asked you about a gun? Majority. Yeah. And they asked me if I had a gun. No, they asked Rodney. Then he asked me, did we have a gun? And told him no. Brian, Rodney was at your house? Majority. Yeah. Brian, when they came by? Majority. No. Rodney was there with us. Randall was there with us. He asked me, did I have a gun? Woody, what were, what did they tell you at this morning? Majority, um, inaudible. I was inaudible in Albany, and he was going to take care of his business. They ain't said nothing about he was going to kill nobody or nothing. They just said that he was going to take care of their business from Chris pulling out the gun and the shooting at them. Woody, what point did uh did they ever tell Jarrell wouldn't talk to them the next day? Did he ever say anything to you about the shooting? Did any of them ever say they was there or whatever? Majority, no, no. They ain't say nothing about it, but I had talked to him, but they ain't never said nothing about it. Woody, did you ask him about it? Majority, no. Brian, you talk to Jarrell? Majori. I had heard, but I ain't. I was thinking the gun. If they fired the gun, I ain't everybody kept saying something about got killed in Albany, something I'd have got killed in Albany. Brian, you talked to Jarrell Friday? Majori. Yeah, I talked to him a couple times, calling him from his phone. Brian, what was your call? What did he say he was doing? Woody. You know where he called from? Majori. He say uh, at first he was in GP. Then they say they was at Springfield. They kept saying different stuff, like I was supposed to be, you know, riding on them or something, banging the police where they calls every time. I call they and tell them I was, they, I mean, ask where that they in Springfield. I'll call like, 
10 more, 10 minutes earlier when y'all um, were in Albany. I'm meeting times from Springfield and Albany to Springfield and Albany, 10 minutes then. Brian, but who are you calling? Majority, huh? Brian, who were you calling? Woody, or was he calling you? Majority, I was calling him to, uh, I was calling uh, Jarrell's phone. Woody, okay? Majority, Jarrell had a phone too. Woody, you were calling on Jarrell's phone? Majority, no. I was calling, uh, yeah, I had Jarrell's phone. I was using Jarrell's phone to call them. Brian, what time do you think this was when y'all were calling each other back and forth? Majority, about 11, 12, the 1. Woody, during the daytime, correct? Majority, yeah, during the daytime. Brian, what kind of car was they in when they came Thursday night? And what time was it? Majority. It was a little black uh, looking car, about 11.30. Woody, was it black? Because, inaudible, because earlier you said it was green. Majori, I said it was black or, uh, or or green. Brian, was it a car or a truck or what? Majori, it was a car, like a little small looking car. Woody, was that the car um, Travis and Josh I know it's, I know it's confusing, man. Cause, majority, yeah, man. Travis, Woody, Travis's brother, majority. Travis's brother's car, Woody. Travis's brother is Josh, majority. Right, Woody. Oh, so they ain't never said nothing to you about it, majority. No, Woody. First, let me ask you this: So you stayed at Rod's house, Rodney's house, the rest of the night. Majority, yes, sir. The morning till the next morning, about 8.30, something like that. Woody, what time did Rodney get home? Majority, Rodney be coming home like 1, 2 in the morning. Woody, yeah, like 1, right? What time did he get home that night? Majority, I don't know. I just knocked out sleep. Woody, well, where did you sleep? At Rod's house, Rodney's house, Majori, so living in the couch, Woody, okay, Majori, Rodney's, Majori, Rodney's room is in the back, Woody, so one more time, what I'm saying, you said that they had a problem with Chris, the red one, Majori, yeah, Woody, they had fired two shots, Majori, two shots, Woody, Chris, Chris ain't from the area. He ain't from Albany. He's from Independence. He stays down there with his girlfriend, but he fires two shots to clear them out. And earlier that day, before they came over, they asked you about a gun. What was it they asked you about a gun? Getting the gun? Majority. Chris? Woody, oh no. They asked Rodney, you said. Majority. No, no, they asked me. Woody, to see if Rodney had a gun? Majority, yeah, they asked me if I have a gun or did Rodney have a gun in the house. Rodney wasn't there. Woody, when was that? When did they ask you that? Majority, Thursday. Woody, that night? Majority, inaudible. Woody, was it during the day or night? Majority, it was during the night. Woody, when they came to get the clothes, Majori, yeah, Woody, okay, Brian, and that was around 11.30 at night, Majori, 11.30, 12 o'clock, about that time, I was asleep, Woody, and then you gave them, um, what kind of clothes did you give them, did you give them to Josh, Majori, no, I ain't giving them to Josh, I gave them, Woody, you said Josh was the only one that wasn't dressed in black. Majority. Right. But he ain't asked for them, no. I don't really know Josh. Like, I ain't never like, no. Woody. Yeah. Majority. I ain't never seen Woody. 
that would be like a stranger showing up at your house. Majority, yeah. Woody, asking to borrow something. Majority. Uh, I know uh, Cordell, Jarrell, and Travis. And so they'd be at E-Tops. And my Uncle Rodney, he'd be always because, like, that's how I got to know them. Woody. And who asked you for the clothes, though? Majority. It was Jarrell. Brian, Jarrell asked you? Majority, yeah. Brian, okay. And they left, and you didn't hear from them until the next day when you called them on the cell phone? Majority, right. Brian, all right. Did you ask them something about what happened with, with what did they do that night or majority? No, no. I was really none of my business. <laughs> Brian, and they didn't offer any information about it? Majority, no. Woody, just answer this. How long have you known Jarrell for? Majority, not long, about five months or so. Woody, you said earlier that y'all, you know, if you see him, he talks, well, y'all go outside and drink a little, bud, and he'll come over to Rodney's and hang out. Matter of fact, he came over at Rodney's house that night when he had asked you for the clothes. He left his cell phone there on charge. Majority on charge. Woody. So that he's pretty comfortable coming to Rodney's house, right? Majority. I'm not uh like spending the night. Woody. He comes over sometimes, occasionally, correct? Brian. And visits? Woody. But you definitely said more than Hi, my name is uh, Mo to them. You know what I'm saying? Y'all hung out a little bit, right? Majority, yeah. Woody. Okay, sir. Um, so Drell should know who you are, right? Majority, right. Brian, all right, man. You got anything else, Woody? Woody. I can't think of anything, anything else. Just, pal, I appreciate you talking to us. Brian, you got anything else you need to add, Mo? Jory, inaudible. Brian, question on tape two. We refer to uh, Mr. Majori. Is that how you pronounce your first name? Majori. Majori. Brian, Majori. Majori. Yes, sir. Brian. Chefney. Majori. Chefney. Brian. Chefney. And your nickname is Mo, correct? Right on you. You got something on you want to add or take away from this statement? Majori. No, sir. Brian, that's it, all right. Woody, wait, uh, okay, I'm asking one more question. Um, you didn't go to Ed Brown Road where that boy was shot that night, right? Majority, no, sir. I ain't had nothing. I had over four people in the car. I want to go with them, but they ain't never tell me where they were. They tell me where they was going, but I ain't really knew. I wanted to go. They said they had too many people in the car. You can't ride, you know, down like ride with four people in the car. So I was like, who, who, well, I'm just going to go to sleep now. I'll see y'all tomorrow when you come get your phone. Woody. All right. And, um, all right. You definitely, you ain't had nothing to do with it here. That's your statement. You didn't. Ain't had anything to do with this killing. Majority, no. Brian, all right, this is going to conclude the tape statement. The time is now 2301. The date is still 51405 at Orleans Parish Prison. All right, y'all, so you just heard it. Uh, I mean, the reason I did his voice and none of the voices on the other transcripts is his voice really sounded like that. He sounded like Froggy. Y'all remember Froggy from The Little Rascals? And, but, so we, I mean, I got there, I, I expected the dude wasn't going to say nothing, but he had enough time to get his story straight. And his story now is, he still sells Jarrell the fuck out. Jarrell said he'd never met Mo, doesn't know it, Mo wasn't around, blah, blah, blah. And then we got all these other witnesses that had already proved Jarrell was lying his ass off. That And, I mean, just a ton of them, right? Uh, that he's lying, lying, lying. And 
then we get Mo. Well, fuck. Mo thought he was smarter than Brian and I. And he was a straight, hardcore gangster. And what he said was, and I don't know if you picked up on it, was that a couple weeks before the murder of Sean Alberts and when Christopher Belazar got shot, they were at E-Tops. Remember, I told you in one of the past episodes, when you take the left off of 190 and going out of Albany towards Sanjipo Parish and you cross the railroad tracks onto North Cafe Line Road. As soon as you cross the railroad tracks, there's a big, long bar, E-Tops. And Sunday nights, that's when blacks or African Americans, whatever you want to call them, from all over the state and Mississippi would come to go to this bar. It was like, it was like a thousand cars there, right? Uh, um, but that was the only time I ever saw him busy it was on Sunday nights. We always had shit out of it, and, uh, fights and gunshots and shit like that. But the um, Mo is saying he was at E-Tops and that cr- the red one, Christopher Belazar, the red one, y'all, is re- he's referring to uh, Christopher Belazar being a light-skinned black male and with a kind of a reddish tint to his hair, right? And um, he said the red one had pulled a gun on him at E-Tops and fired off two shots, and that's how he knew of him. But he swore to God he wasn't there that night, right? And he not only does that, he he puts it on Jarrell Marshall and everybody else that he thinks is already ratted, Cordero and um, uh, RJ and, and all of them. He's like, fuck that. They came and tried to borrow some clothes from me. They got all black clothes, you know, and asked me about a gun. Mm, yeah, fuck you. And then him, the, the best of it all was when I got him, uh, um, he said, no, no, I tried to go with him, but uh, – they, they said there was too many people in the car. Get the fuck out of here. The four people in a Ford Explorer, you can't ride? Shit. You must be, not really be their homie, right? And But that was a story that he heard about it afterwards, where, but he never says he has any direct knowledge. Um, definitely says he wasn't there, that he was home asleep and, and all this shit and whatever. So what do you have now? We never recovered the firearm, um, but you had so many witnesses, including a living witness, Christopher Belazar. Mo calls him Red. Yeah, let me just say this real quick. If I say Red, or like in this case, uh, when I've been reading directly from the transcripts and I say the N word, that is not Woody Overton. I don't give a shit what color you are. I am not racist in any kind of way. I'm telling a story, all right? Uh, um, so if I ever say the N word, it's, it is being directly read from something that's a matter of public record or read or anything like that. Um, but anyway, the Mo is, is denying everything, but you know what? He's no stranger to the game, right? So we, um, we get him, we do the paperwork, transfer paperwork, and we drive his ass back to Livingston Parish and take him and lock him up in Livingston Parish Jail for first-degree murder of Sean Alberts and attempted first-degree murder of Christopher Belazar and then the two armed robberies. Um, This dude's been in, like, prison almost his entire life. And I forget how old he was. I think he's in, like, young 20s. And then he's, he's been shot up, you know, um, He's got scars, bullet holes all in his body and stuff. I mean, it's just, that's the only life he ever knew, you know? So, but anyway, we bring him back, lock him up in our jail. Boom. (laughs) It's not over. I'm going to do one more episode. Um, The, on the next episode, I'm going to tell you what happens once he gets back to Livingston Parish. And then in that, I will include the trial and I'll tell you what happened to him and what is what has since happened. What has happened to him since. Okay. Very important. Last episode. We'll finish it out. And I hope y'all are enjoying the series. Um appreciate and love each and every one of y'all. Go download Real Life Real Crime anywhere you can get a podcast or or 
follow me on Instagram at Real Life Real Crime or at Overton Woody. Go download our free Real Life Real Crime community app from the App Store. Join, y'all. It's for free. It's got everything true crime in the world that you can imagine in it. Um, daily news articles, members posting. You, know, you can win coins. It's got games. It's got all kinds of shit. Go check it out. And it's only censored by me. Patreon convicts, thank you again for your support. The show would not run without you. By the time you got this, the second season of Scorch Justice, my other podcast should be out. And it's going to be, I'm going to be diving. When I say diving, I mean like deep diving, big show production, everything that I don't have here, the music, the big producers and all that, that Cloud 10 Media and our Heart Radio are having me do. Scorch Justice season one, if you haven't heard it, it I covered the murders of Jessica Lynn Chambers and in um, Mandy Mingxing show. Go listen to it. It'll blow your mind. And, and it's definitely a Scorch case. Um, it's 10 episodes long. And so go check it out. Totally different than Real Life Real Crime. It is a production where me, this is me just telling my own stories behind the mic. But I get to use my experience, and I really do believe I brought a conclusion to the case that hasn't been recognized yet. But on the second season, which drops on July the 5th, holy shit, the I'm going to be covering the conviction of, of Darley Routier, who's now on death row in Texas for the murder of one of her three children. Two of the children, two of the boys, young boys were murdered. The other one was upstairs asleep with the dad. They were brutally murdered, stabbed to death. And she they only tried her for one in case they didn't get the conviction. They could come back and try her for the other one, right? Well, she, they got her. They convicted her in 1996 and sentenced her to die. And she's been doing the pills all these years. Now, the case is absolutely scorched. Oh my God. You you would look at it and think, mm, 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 yeah, this dirty bitch, how, how could she do this to her kids, right? And then you get to where I'm at, and y'all, I'm way, way deep, okay? And I've had um, numerous personal communications with Darley Routier from Texas Death Row, after I had got into the case and found some things that are just absolutely shocking to me. And so go listen to season two of Scorch Justice. Download it anywhere you can get a podcast. Like it and subscribe and all that good podcaster stuff. And Lopa, if you are a lifer from Toma, Wisconsin, and you want to become an organ donor, you don't have to be from Louisiana, but LOPA stands for the Louisiana Organ Procurement Agency. If you want to become an organ donor, go to LOPA.org, take two minutes, fill out the questionnaire, turn it in, and be a hero. Save lives. And I'm Woody Overton, your host of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. Until next time or ever, don't let me catch you down on Murder by You. Peace. Real Life Real Crime is a true crime podcast brought to you by your host, Woody Overton, executive producer, Jim Chapman with Envision Podcast Studios. Your music is provided by Chase Tyler and the Chase Tyler Band. Follow me on Instagram at Real Life Real Crime or at Overton Woody. Check out our numerous social media pages. Also, go to the app store and download our free real life real crime community app which contains all things real life real crime and true crime and uncensored and run by me wherever you listen to a podcast go like subscribe and review to real life real crime or my other podcast scorch justice thank you You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney prior to or during any question. If you can't afford one, the court will appoint one for you. Do you understand your rights?